Hello, everyone, and welcome to another wonderful day of chemistry. So today we're going to be talking about Lewis acids and bases as we continue to evolve our description of acids and bases from simple proton donors and acceptors to something more. And this is going to be very analogous to what we did when we went from Arrhenius acids bases, so uh, <coughs> breaking apart while losing a proton or releasing a hydroxide group to something more complex. We can do this as we move to the Lewis definition. So this shifts the focus from what, ha what the protons want to what electrons want. Because as we saw last semester looking at Lewis structures, it turns out what electrons want is what really matters. So when we're looking at a Lewis space, this is essentially a way of saying this is something that has too many electrons and wants to share. It wants its electrons to reach out and find some positive charge to please make them happy. On the converse side, Lewis acids are going to be electron acceptors. So, so this is something that's already a little too positive. It wants a few more electrons to make it happy. So let's go ahead and take a look at a classic Bronsted acid-based system. So hydrofluoric acid plus ammonia. So hydrofluoric acid we know is going to be an acid, and ammonia we know is going to be a base. And that produces fluoride and ammonia. However, we can look at this through the Lewis acid base system. So ammonium being a base is an electron donor as well as a proton acceptor. Because look at those little lone pairs out there. Nitrogen doesn't like having its lone pairs doing anything. So they're going to reach out and grab the most positively charged thing out there, which is a hydrogen. That hydrogen, well, it can only have one bond at a time. So it has to kick out the other uh, its other bond, which happens to be a Lewis acid, because fluorine doesn't exactly like to be neutrally charged. It likes to be a little negative. It's a very electronegative element. And so as a result, fluoride is now pretty happy because it has more electrons. Nitrogen's pretty happy because it has more, it has more positive charge. And everyone gets a little bit more happy. So this is really what we're looking at with Lewis, uh, Lewis acid-based behavior. And most often, this is known for forming reactive complexes. So for example, water here has lots of extra electrons, so it could be a pretty good uh, Lewis base. It can go ahead and reach out. Carbon, in the meantime, is going to be a pretty good Lewis <coughs> acid, because sitting here in between two very negatively charged oxygens, that carbon's a little bit stretched thin. So CO2 ends up being our Lewis uh, Lewis acid, and water, our Lewis base. And this forms a nice, actually kind of cool uh, species. This is one form of carbonic acid, where now we have a positively charged uh, oxygen, okay, not exactly too happy, and a negatively charged oxygen, fairly happy, especially because it can share via resonance with one of the other oxygens. However, this can only last so long. So one of the protons moves over, and now we actually have a fairly uh, stable species. This is really what we're thinking about when we're looking at carbonic acid. And it turns out it is a Lewis acid base adduct. And so one of the ways to look at how these forms is to look at what the electrons want. So these Lewis acids, because they essentially want more electrons, are often called electrophiles. And these Lewis bases, because they want to reach out and grab that positive charge, are often termed nucleophiles, as they grab out and grab that positively charged nuclei. So we're mostly going to be using the acid-base nomenclature. However, most of organic chemistry is going to focus on this behavior of moving the electrons and figuring out what they want to do. And they're going to use this electrophile-nucleophile terminology. And it's going to be fairly useful as it, it encompasses a large portion of chemistry. However, for now, one of the things I want to focus on is a lot of these cool Lewis acid base adducts actually tend to show their own acid base behavior. For example, by combining CO2 and water, we made carbonic acid. Well, it turns out that carbonic acid is, well, an acid. So it can lose a proton and make bicarbonate, which can then lose a second proton to make carbonate. So this is one of those things that we don't often think about. Because you can call CO2 as being an acid if I put it in solution. CO2 itself doesn't end up releasing a proton, 
but it makes something that can release a proton. And that's a very important thing to keep in mind. And it turns out this isn't true of just something like CO2. It often applies to a lot of metal cations because most of our metal cations, they're fairly positively charged. So if I go ahead and throw aluminum into water, it's gonna try and reach out for all those electrons in water and often makes these metal water complexes. And this is a fairly representative species. However, I don't exactly expect you to predict what sort of complex will form. But one of the things that ends up happening is that these cations are going to typically be coordinated to all of these variously negatively charged oxygens. And you end up with these kind of cool metal complexes. Now, I've got a whole bunch of negatively charged oxygens with a very positively charged aluminum. So one of the things that can happen is that aluminum really wants more of those electrons. So it can pull uh, on the electrons of those oxygens hard enough for the oxygen to say, you know what, I really don't want that proton. My electrons have better things to do. They can more or less form a full bond with the aluminum. So as that water comes in, it's going to go ahead and grab a proton from aluminum. So this means that aluminum is acting as an acid. It's giving up a proton to water, not directly as the metal, but it's making the whole aluminum complex act as an acid, making a weak conjugate base. So when you throw aluminum in water, we've essentially formed a weak acid base pair, not the aluminum itself, but the whole Lewis base adduct. And it turns out that we can predict this behavior for any number of our cations. So you'll notice that if I'm looking at most of our neutral cations, things like lithium, sodium, and potassium, their pKa is quite high. So generally, they're worse acids than water is on its own. However, by the time we get down to something like aluminum, it has a pKa of 5. Now, part of the issue is, just like we saw last time, I'm not going to exactly throw aluminum or iron into solution on their own. I'm often going to introduce them as a salt. So for example, what would happen if I throw iron trichloride or iron three chloride into water? Well, it's going to end up acting as a weak acid. And it does so first by exchanging those chloride ligands for water ligands. So instead of being bound to three chlorides, those chlorides go off and do their own thing because they're plenty happy being negative charges. The iron is consoled with its loss by being surrounded by water, but it turns out it really wants to steal some of those electrons from the water. And so it acts as a weak acid to generate an iron hydroxide complex and releases a free proton. So it turns out this reaction occurs with a pKa of about 2.2, or again, a Ka of about six times 10 to the negative third. So this is quite an acidic complex. And it turns out that this Lewis acidity can cause actually many metal salts to acidify aqueous solutions. And this is the origin of several etching techniques where you add in iron chloride to acidify a solution, which can be used to do acid etching on things like copper. And so one of the things that we can do is by using the pKa of these metals, we can predict the pH of these resulting solutions. And it's a good way to fine tune the pH of a system. So that brings us to the end of this introductory chapter of Lewis acids and, or acids and bases. Next time, we're gonna be looking at how we can perturb these equilibriums by invoking Le Chatelier's. Until then, take care.